Welcome to Think Tech's virtual meetups for the summer season, uh, an initiative organized by the Saudi Ministry of Communications and Information Technology. Uh, Think Tech aims to create a stimulating uh, digital environment um, and to spur digital awareness about emerging technologies. Um, in this topic, uh, we are uh, happy to introduce you to a series of meetups focusing on emerging technologies. And today we have the session, Machine Learning, uh, a Gate to the Future. Uh, so my name is uh, uh, Dr. Ayman Shakari, and I will be uh, your moderator for this session. Uh, I'm uh, the group Global Head of Artificial Intelligence for Devo Team Group. I manage all AI and machine learning activities uh, for the group. Uh, I have two PhDs in AI, the first from MIT on uh, fraud detection subjects, and the second from Maria on reinforcement learning. I led several international projects on artificial um, intelligence in several sectors, retail, banking, insurance, pharma, and, and healthcare. Um, machine learning is uh, now considered to be one of the biggest innovation uh, since the, the microchip and machine learning used to be um, a fanciful concept from science fiction, but now it's becoming a daily reality. Um, neural networks uh, imitating the process of real uh, neurons in the brain are paving the way toward uh, breakthroughs in machine learning is called deep learning. Um, machine learning can help us live a happier, uh, healthier, and more productive lives uh, if we know how to, to, to harness its power. Uh, so I want to thank our great speakers for uh, the time they um, devoted to us in order to clarify the different uh, impact of machine learning in our future and the new trends. And I will give the floor to um, our speakers to introduce, to introduce themselves. And I will start with uh, Igor. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Dr. Igor Holos. Um, I, um, I am a lead data scientist in a dev team in Denmark, um, where uh, you know, we are a consultancy. We are a full development house uh, for uh, machine learning projects. Um, my PhD is actually more in behavioral research, but um, uh, combining statistics and machine learning and predictive analytics has been, yeah, that's been a project for about over a decade now. Um, my background's been in mental health and uh, behavior in educational systems, and then now in much more in retail and, and much more broadly. Um, and um, um, yeah, I'm excited to be part of this. Okay. Uh, so I will pass to Dr. Nikhil Gulati. Can you introduce, introduce yourself, please? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Nikhil Gulati. I, um, I lead the data science uh, uh, services for a company called Baker Hughes. Uh, uh, we are a global largest uh, energy technology company. My focus is on building AI and ML products for the uh, oil and gas and energy industry. Uh, we have a big vision to make uh, uh, energy um, business more safer, cleaner, and more efficient. And data and the animal is playing a big role in that. And my background is uh, um, in engineering. I'm an electrical engineer by education, and I've spent uh, many years in software machine learning across different um, verticals like international services, aviation, healthcare, oil and gas. Um, and um, I bring a perspective from an enterprise uh, world and how these technologies are uh, making their impact. So excited to be here and talk uh, talk to everyone about uh, about the field. Thank you very much. So Jason, the stage is yours. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for having me on this um, Q and A and discussion. My name is Jason Isam. I'm a technical program manager at Facebook. I work on AI specifically, building infrastructure services and platforms that power a lot of the machine learning experiences that you see across the family of apps at uh, Facebook. Um, my background also, I'm an engineer who worked at Microsoft for some time in big data, in search, and in unified communication, 
also worked with Amazon in distributed computing before I joined Facebook for the last couple of years working on artificial intelligence infrastructure. Thank you so much for having me here again. Okay, so thank you. Uh, so since we are talking about the future, I'm going to start by asking all the speakers the questions. Uh, what is the machine learning project that um, has marked you the most and that fits into a gate for the future perspective? For example, for my side, um, I used to use um, customized neural networks to find the new molecular formulas uh, to kill uh, the vascular networks of cancer cell. So uh, I will begin by uh, Jay. Absolutely. So I'm going to share a very recent experience, a personal experience that I'm having and really enjoying so much on a daily basis with uh, artificial intelligence. And this is basically the use of virtual reality headsets. I recently got one and mm -hmm. I've been loving it for the past week and using it significantly. Uh, virtual reality headsets are basically a device that you wear over your head and it it instantly transports you to an immersive, uh, different reality where you can experience um, different things. An example okay. uh, would be basically doing immersive exercises. I've done now a lot of um, cardio exercises um, in different exotic places with a personal trainer. And the, uh, the entire workout is actually personalized according to your skill set and how you're advancing throughout the course. So it really feels for me that I have a personal trainer sitting with me 24 seven available at my disposal basically and assisting me to get better in achieving a lot of my health goals. You know, another example I'm also experiencing with this is tourism, you know, being able to walk in Thailand and the, the streets of Thailand or in, in India, you know, and experiencing these cultural things at a very personal and very close uh, level takes this experience to a whole new uh, enjoyable and so surreal. And this is something that uh, is, it has a lot of opportunities. We're just starting with virtual reality and wearables. So the, the opportunities are endless there. Okay, very, very exciting projects. So congratulations for this. Uh, Dr. Nikhil. Yes, uh, well, I I am very excited actually about the prospects of uh, AI uh, applied to public infrastructure management. And one of my favorite projects uh, have been in uh, understanding how the electricity grid works. Uh, it's a very traditional infrastructure, drives mostly all the countries. And uh, what we have tried to do in the past is to figure out how outages in electric grid uh, propagate and in this network and as they have a direct impact on the lives of people. So uh, the application around figuring out prediction of different types of outages, what could go out in terms of the, 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 the assets that drive the electric grid, as well as figuring out if the outage happened, um, how do you best actually um, roll out your uh, crew to fix these outages in, term, in, in, in light of storms. Similar to think about how Uber can optimize where to place the, the uh, drivers uh, in their network based on certain criteria. Uh, the electric companies really want to optimize the process of not just predicting the outages, but also be able to fix them fast uh, and distribute the crew based on the intensity. So there's a lot of work going on first to understand the data as well as to uh, uh, mitigate these outages ahead of time and then fix them uh, as fast as possible. Okay, very nice project. And you, uh, what about you, Igor? Yeah, so I, uh, for mine, actually, I think I'll mention two projects uh, because we were lucky enough to work with the public health authority uh, during the the first spring outbreak of COVID. And, you know, a large part of the project, of course, was just to get help them get handled in the data that they could get and organize it uh, about medicine stocks and uh, and uh, protective gear etc but then you know you, you help some you you help an, uh, you help an organization get get control of their data and organize their data they can start doing 
much more. And of course, within a couple, within a month or two, they were able to start doing things like forecasting and and predicting use and predict, predicting uh, out of stock dates and risk of running out of stock and a lot of these different use cases about like, well, how what do we actually care about? And it was really fascinating for me to see a pretty traditional public institution go through that transformation from you know, very much old school technology and, and decentralized analyses that really weren't very, very well organized into something where they could actually deploy, uh, you know, make use of data scientists because they had enough data. Um, and then the other one is much more on a smaller end and that is uh, we're seeing more and more and more, again, relatively conservative companies go into finally get the courage to tackle their uh, unstructured data. Um, so public and private companies have been ha- have been using manual human processes to, to, to process images, process documents that are scanned, process other stuff that seemed hard. And data science was always very risky because, you know, we could never, you know, five years ago, you, you sort of didn't, it was, it was hard to project manage. That was the perspective, right? And so for us to get to a place where these customers are feeling secure about it, uh, that's really exciting to see. And so we had a customer that uh, was processing a lot of news articles. Um, and um, of course, they had humans read it. And for us to be able to extract information, do some basic NLP on that, you know, it wasn't any cutting edge machine learning, but to get them to a place where they could automate this pipeline, which until now had to be manual because because it was a website. What do you do with a website, right? And yeah. automation was having a really hard time with it, getting them a good enough results. And so for us to be able to de- deploy this, you know, basic tenets of machine learning pro- um, products into this pipeline and help them automate it and, um, uh, and do that for very, uh, have it very well project managed, right? We were under budget, under ahead of schedule, things like that. So it was very much low risk. Um, so those are the kind of things that have been exciting me these, this year. Okay. And I feel like that, and that's what's going to be exciting. I'm sorry. So sort of going forward, I think we're mm-hmm. seeing more conservative public institutions now starting to go in. And I think we're going to see a lot of interesting use cases, a lot of value built out of, in, in, for a lot of people in places that until now have been too shy to go in. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, since you talk Igor, about the, the, the automation part, um, uh, today with the emergence of the automated machine learning 2.0, uh, questions arise about the place of the data scientists in this wave. Uh, what is your opinion uh, on automated machine learning uh, and how do you see the future of, of the data scientist since you are a data scientist? Yeah, I so very much in in my world, definitely within Devo Team, since we are a consultancy, and so we help other customers um, build out their machine learning and data science and big data sort of competencies and and, and move into this new era. Um, I think the value of AI services, um, auto auto machine learning, and other uh, other products that are not custom, they're on some way off the shelf. It's it's it has a huge uh, power in democratizing the access to machine learning. Um, of course, you know, first movers and uh, young companies and uh, very tech and engineering competent companies. Obviously, you know, we have Facebook here. Um, they've felt free to go in and uh, and experiment and explore, and they're very mature. But you take, you know more conservative companies i think they've, they've been they've been having a really hard time so i think with auto ml with ai services you know for example you know it no longer makes any sense for anybody try to do um translation machine translation in any way that's not google translator or, or microsoft translate or google google translator microsoft translator right it's been solved and i think outperforming them is beyond the scope of most people's needs. And I think there's more and more use cases where that is becoming true. And that also means that within an, within a small project of a couple of sprints, you can actually get a lot of value. And so I think data scientists are moving in my view, in my worldview into a role of, a, of actually a sort of 
a trust, <laughs> we use this term of trusted advisor, but sort of really understand where is it that we need to be doing custom work? What is actually what's hard? And actually, I think to some extent that, that often has been the role of the engineer, right? Product owners, they don't always know what is hard, right? It was always the role of the engineers to be like, this is easy, this is hard, right? Um, and so this thing we can knock out, right? And for product owner or project manager, so that, that may not be obvious, but, but there are other things that are harder. And so I think it's becoming important for data scientists to really understand what of this they don't need to buy. Uh, what of this they can, or what of this they don't need to build? What of this they can just go benchmark a couple of tools? I think we need to be better. Unfortunately, I think we're getting to an era where either you work closely with data engineers or, or data scientists are relatively good data engineers, so you can help deploy things more. But uh, you know, go there and help your organizations test out the things off the shelf, and then move beyond that, right? Where where relevant? So. AI services, then try auto ML, then start doing some, uh, you know, uh, some custom trained machine learning, and then maybe start doing actual custom algorithms. I think there's a sequence there and not most problems don't need it. And some problems need it. And I think the role is in recognizing where we should be spending our effort. Okay, so in terms of business application of machine learning for the future, do you think that the job of data scientists will exist in the five or ten uh, future years? Can you repeat that question again? Uh, I said today um, we reach a, a high maturities on the application of machine learning in several uh, industries like retail. We are very mature for predicting, for detecting anomalies, predicting uh, different items in the supply chain, uh, in the healthcare part for uh, detecting some disease. Yeah. And, um, and uh, those applications are based on the customization of machine learning models. So with the emergence of of uh, automated machine learning, do you think that the job of data scientists will continue to exist for the next five or 10 uh, years? Absolutely. I think with, with us maturing the use cases, we're going to start seeing more and more demand for reduced error rates, um, right? Okay. And for much more precise decision making. You know, when you're looking at something experimental, you know, having I don't know, 80% precision, it's good. I mean, that's better than what we've been able to do before, right? But as we start maturing, we start chasing those edge cases and those are not going to be off the shelf, right? Those are really going to, um, those are, I mean, obviously that's where the hard work is, right? Getting to 80% precision, most problems are relatively easy is the last 20% that becomes very complicated. And that is where we, you know, the, the auto ML and and pre-trained models and AI services and all of this stuff is just going to get us to the point of that okay. of taking yes. care of the easiest part really fast, and uh, so we don't have to spend time on it, right? And and handle stupid things, right? That are just annoying, and really focus focus on the new problems that are that are hard to solve still. I think there's there's okay. we, yeah we have a lot of work left, even though we're pretty mature. In Okay, so Dr. Nihil and, uh, and Dr. Jason, how uh, are we as individuals adapting to machine learning today and how we can anticipate the impact of machine learning uh, in the future? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. And I actually do want to add something to your previous question about relevance of data science. I think, uh, uh, there's this whole debate of generalist data scientists and the specialist data scientists. And I think as we move towards, when we talk about consumer internet businesses, there's a lot of curated data. Companies like Google, Facebook, all these companies have are data first companies. They build every foundation thinking from that perspective. A lot of enterprises never thought that way. They are now realizing uh, what the importance of it. So the data is dirty and there's a whole domain expertise. So if you, the data scientists will actually be very relevant, especially given this, uh, the, the specialist nature of the data science to be able to make real impact in these industries. Uh, so I you know, just want to mention that. From, for, for your other question, I think uh, the impact is immense. Uh, uh, there are almost uh, every industry you talk about these days is thinking about uh, one way or the other 
you leverage these technologies or do internal transformation, uh, figure out whether they have data or not. If they don't have data, putting strategy in place for uh, data governance, data management, so that they can reap those benefits. Uh, but I think the biggest impact is in our uh, day-to-day life uh, beyond the technology that we are already familiar with is on healthcare, uh, is on the transportation and a lot of uh, social good. And that's where I really uh, like to focus. For example, transportation, I think the huge impact is the solvable problem. We care about autonomous vehicle, but we don't really fully understand when these kind of fleets would come, uh, autonomous fleets will be on the road, what impact it would have on the urban life and on the way uh, we do our work or we anticipate uh, additional things. So these are some of the areas uh, along with healthcare, I think we are gonna have significant impact, but um, it's gonna need, um, it's gonna need not just technology, but policy to have a real impact uh, to enable these and bring them into the real life in future uh, going forward. Okay. Nice. Um, Absolutely. So also asking that question here, um, you know, if we look at, at AI and machine learning, um, different use cases or the consumer based use cases is to simplify our daily tasks and life, right? Enable positive experiences in the things that we do. Uh, if you look at our houses now, there's a lot of internet of things scattered around from smart thermostats to digital assistants who can help you with managing your calendars, reminding you about things, you know, helping you order something that it delivered. Um, that help us go to work, avoiding traffic, avoiding incidents also on the road, uh, avoiding bad weather in some areas. So all of these things help you uh, um, have a positive experience throughout your day. And, and, and simplifies a lot of the um, mundane tasks that you might have to remember to do as well. So this is an example where the, um, the AI is helping us in our daily life in either we, in a way we know it or we don't know it as well. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, Dr. Jason, um, today a lot of people are terrified about uh, the, the role of machine learning um, in the job part and they are asking, if machine learning will replace some jobs and uh, will cancel some jobs, what do you think about this, uh, these aspects of machine learning in replacing uh, human being in some uh, tasks? You know, um, I wouldn't say that machine learning and AI is replacing human beings. I would say it supplements uh, our uh, knowledge and experience and the uh, the set of um, things that we can deliver. So it's, it's, it's an assistant on our side. So for example, it, help, it helps us scale. It goes through a lot of decision-making and gives us a decision, and then we can actually act on it. We can take that decision and say, yes, I want to act on it in a, in, a, in a supportive way, or I just want to ignore it. So the way I see it is, is machine learning is going to enable a lot of experiences that are going to complement our life. And as people in the community, we're going to be using this to uh, do a better job in, in our work, in our daily work. So I wouldn't say it's replacing, but it's complementing and it's giving us better skill sets and uh, more availability of these skill sets that we can apply them on a daily basis. Imagine that you no longer have to spend a lot of time. For example, doctors, you know, uh, what machine learning is being used to analyze X-ray images and give a recommendation, right? Instead of spending, you know, an hour or two by a doctor to do that and, and not having to stay with, with their patients, machine learning can reduce that time to, you know, minutes, right? Therefore, you have doctors who have more time available to practice their skill set at the patient and providing more impact and positive life experiences. Okay, nice. So uh, uh, the energy of machine learning models is data. 
uh, it's the fuel that will make uh, these learning models run. One of the biggest challenges in machine learning is the data sources. Uh, there are many challenges in this area, learning from heterogeneous data available on a multiplicity of channels, um, manage uncertain information, identify and deal with uh, rare events beyond uh, uh, purely statistical approaches and uh, work by combining sources of knowledge and sources of into the learning process. Um, so what do you think about, about these uh, challenging parts of data source and their impact of the quality of delivering uh, the right machine learning models that really will impact our future? Did you have a specific person in mind? Should I take yeah. it? <laughs> yeah. Who wants to answer? Yes. So I'll start because actually, you know, we run into this often, given that we're often taking um, customers from not being tech and data first into, you know, what we call data driven transformation, right? Start taking advantage of data, you know, and, and we've talked about this, a, we talked about this a lot about like, you probably have data. You just don't have it organized. You don't have it in a place where they're available for your analyses, right? They're probably stuck in some sort of a business system and you don't have the right to export without paying the, the owner of that system. Things like, you know, there's there's barriers, but you probably have data that we can we can start. And I think um, from, uh, um, from, I think there's a lot of business problems that if, 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 if a, the right data scientist comes in and, 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 and uh, enters the conversation, um, that they, they, there is enough data to answer uh, those problems, right? I think there's certain 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 novel data science problems that most people don't have enough data, and right, there's definitely startups and things where um, where the, the fact that they've built up a database becomes becomes their their differentiator, right? I keep thinking about trying to remember what their name was, but uh, there's a startup that's that's using drone video footage to help farmers understand their crop development, right? And their biggest differentiator, their biggest value is the fact that they have this huge video and image database, right, of crops that nobody else has. So there's, there's definitely some of that. Um, but I think there's definitely a lot of business problems where probably the data exists, it just needs to be organized. It needs to be put to use. Um, it needs to be made available for learning and at times and in other cases it's coming in fast enough that even if you don't have the archive of it to do machine learning we could potentially do some basic automation and start capturing enough data that within a you know, let's say a year we can start deploying machine learning on solve start to stop to start solving whatever problem you're trying to solve okay nice thank you so so, so dr Rego and dr Nihil, um <laughs> One of the most challenging aspects of machine learning is the industrialization part. Today, we are moving from the wave of proof of concept and proof of value initiatives um, made for, for the, the, the machine learning to the industrializations of big projects around machine learning in different fields. Uh, so machine learning cannot exist alone in an application. It must converge with other technologies. And what are the most impacting uh, aspects to, to success the industrialization of machine learning? Yeah, I'll, I'll start and uh, hopefully Igor can uh add based on his experience. Uh, what I feel is that before even we look at the technology that would make any machine learning project or solution that we put operationalize, we need to understand the top, top, top down and bottom up approach. So you first obviously have identified a business problem that can be solved through machine learning or not. But then there's this whole idea of users, a lot of time uh, beyond consumer internet businesses and I try to create that contrast is in enterprises, a lot of people are not talking to the end users who are going to eventually use them and how anything that machine learning solution would produce as an outcome would be consumed by these users, right? That's a big aspect of making these successful. So we have to think from that perspective. In terms of uh, um, operational technology, I think machine learning is a small part. There's a lot of technical debt that comes in to operationalize the solutions, there's data management pipelines, there's a, a thought about 
once you deploy something, once you deploy certain models, how would they um, uh, get retrained? How would they understand what has changed in their source data systems? These questions typically is asked afterwards, but we need to start asking these questions ahead of time and then have to go back to your users and say, what do you expect? And if it's a specific domain, you ask your domain experts, do I expect data to change every week, every month? how bad it is going to take me and my model performance as a hit. And then you have to put in these um, pipelines, whether they are on cloud or on the edge, uh, to have these engineering, uh, I call them engineering pipelines, right, in place, so that your model can not just produce the outcome that you're looking for, but also be able to adapt to changing uh, uh, regimes on your input data sources. And that's very essential uh, to be able to get value uh, from the model. You, we may get value for first month and then suddenly users would start you know, not believing in that. So that brings me to the last aspect I would say is important. Is a lot of these ML models are still black box if you're talking about some of the newer uh, approaches, especially in enterprises. Uh, if you are providing machine learning as an enhanced solution, the users want to see why it created a certain prediction. Uh, you know, so this whole idea of explainable ML is really getting traction now. Uh, they don't want to just trust it. It's like 15 years ago or 10 years ago when we had Google Maps and now Google Maps tell us hey, there's a better route and I just simply say yes and I know that I trust Google Maps because it's gonna save me 20 minutes of uh, traffic. I trust it, but it has taken 10 years for us to build a trust in that kind of system. And it's gonna take, I think, another 10 years for everyone to, especially for critical applications in the industry. If there are critical applications which require safety or other issues to be taken into account. You have to think about uh, explainability of these models and the outcomes that they produce. Okay, nice. Uh, Igor, what is your opinion about the industrialization of machine learning project? Yeah, I think, um... I think Nikhil touched on a lot of the really important aspects. And I think what what was maybe implied, or I'm not sure how clearly was heard, is that you know AI products are just another product to really be included in a portfolio and treated as such. And um, and to have um, project managers and product managers that understand what's happening. Uh, to be able to ma to uh, manage um, teams that include data scientists, right, uh, or that are ha handling AI products um, and their own specific needs and their own specific needs uh, to, in terms of management and and updates and all of that stuff. So, I think um, that um, I think that that's 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 a, that's a bit of a sort of a mind shift that I think I'm still seeing a lot of our customers struggle with uh, going from like a project, like, hey, now we have this to like, no, this is just a product and the product's gonna have a backlog of, of improvements they wanna handle and, and it has maintenance that needs to be handled. Um, and um, it has, you know, we need to be doing experiments for maybe doing some new way of doing it, right? Benchmark improvements, things like that. So, you know, we, we're used to doing that in many other aspects, or at least, you know, tech forward companies are. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously the leaders in the AI space, that's what they're doing. That's why they're really so far ahead. Um, and so I think that that's, that's, that's a change of mindset uh, that uh, we're seeing now and that, will industrialize AI. Okay, great. Uh, Dr. Jason, today we are facing a zoo of frameworks, uh, of machine learning frameworks, which are very mature, like uh, Scikit-Learn, TensorFlow, Keras. Why uh, are companies, and especially big companies like Facebook today, still investing in machine learning research? And how um, are they using it to their advantage? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, machine learning and all of this AI is, is an emerging field, right? And we're just scratching the, the top of the iceberg, right? Um, a lot of um, experiences that you see on the platform or the family of apps at Facebook um, use AI, right? And they make the experience of us who are using the social media better, right? In terms of recommending better 
um, uh, things to see posts, right? Uh, you're seeing the right ads, uh, doing um, manipulations on images so that you can see the 360 and the 180 um, views of the picture. So all of these, they create engagement, they create excitement, uh, they bring people to the platform uh, to have better experiences. And once you do this, you build better products. And this is why, um, why companies are investing, right? You build better products that solve business, critical business use cases uh, that create excitement that says, yes, I want to do this. I want to, I want to experience a type of, you know, AI experience. Um, and then there's a lot of uh, opportunities where you can uh, address social good, right? By, um, you know, helping charities. There's a lot of charities that are raising money on social media, right? By pairing them with the right groups, with the right folks who have the same interests, that they can donate money yeah, to support a particular cause. You know, it has a really good impact on the society that we're living in. And so basically, it's a lot of people benefit from that. Okay, nice. So I have another question for speakers. What are the, the tapped opportunities in, in the field of machine learning? Do, do, do you think that there is uh, some, uh, some, pro, some uh, fields which still immature and we have to, 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 to go uh, more in details and to investigate more and more in, in those subfields in machine learning? Uh, or do you think that we reach um, the maturities in all fields of machine learning? Uh, I think for me, one of the most important um, things is um, many machine learning systems excel in specific area, but prove to be uh, incompetent outside of it. Uh, so however, um, systems operate in a real environment such as robots, um, must be able to perform several uh, actions in parallel, uh, such as memorizing facts, assimilating new concepts, acting on the real world and interacting with humans. And, um, and one uh, of the most promising areas for solving these problems is um, the deep reinforcement learning. Uh, uh, what do you think about those approaches, Dr. Nikhil? I, I know that you, you used to work with those, these kinds of approaches. I think the way I would frame this is, you know, the, as the title of this, webinar is, you know, the machine learning is only a gateway to the future. So when you actually step back and say, uh, look at AI, either in a classical sense or the way research has gone through, there are these five pillars. There's learning, there is uh, perception, there is reasoning, there is problem solving and language understanding, right? So these things have to come together to really uh, make um, you know, take us to the next step uh, with AI. And that's why I think first, a lot of companies are uh, still putting research money uh, in these areas. Uh, and then other part goes back to your question about data. We are still in the, we are still trying to solve the learning part of the AI, you know, where we are trying to learn from our previous experiences in the form of historical data, right? There's this whole idea of learning under uncertainty, which goes back to reasoning or perception and you don't have data, you're just trying to, as a human, figure out, can I work, can I put a machine into an environment and let the machine interact with its environment, get some feedback and adapt as you do. I mean, this is where reinforcement learning or the roots of reinforcement learning comes from. And uh, now they, it has been now married to somewhat uh, what people are targeting with deep uh, neural networks about building some reasoning. It's not obviously there and it cannot mm -hmm. really reason like a human being, but that's the idea to marry now because mm -hmm. that's where you would see that we, are we are trying to touch all these pillars of AI now from learning to reasoning to problem solving. Um, and um, some of these uh, areas are straightforward because the domain is very constrictive. For example, reinforcement learning is very well applied to uh, how do we do ad placement better? Uh, let, let me show an ad to a person and see if he clicks or not, right? And then update uh, behind the scenes, my model or whatever we need to do. But these are very small problems. To make take it to a larger uh, system where you said you have to do many tasks at, a, at the same time, 
and interact with the system and get different types of feedback. Uh, I think that's the holy grail. And uh, it's essential that we keep doing research in those areas and see how they can be applied to different uh, applications. Okay. Uh, another question, Dr. Nihil, because I, I face this question every day. Uh, when uh, I go to, 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 to present some uh, neural networks uh, approach to uh, my customers, they say to me, we know what what is passing in the first le level uh, and uh, in the first layer of a neural networks in, in the last layer. But between the first one and the last one, we ignore uh, the different operations. So how can I trust uh, on what it is passing between the first and the last layer? Uh, and the question is how the human being can trust on the results given by machine learning uh, in terms of interpretability and explainability of those models? Yeah, that's a great, great question. I, I think uh, there's a trade-off what we are seeing between getting better performance of our models or building better models through these uh, black box techniques uh, yes. and uh, saying, hey, they are not really explainable, so how do we bring that trade out? Do I go back to a classical machine, classical technique and have enough data so that it could really get very close to what I can get from, uh, you know, a, a, like a deep neural network, but it also needs a lot of data, right? Um, so, I don't think there's an answer yet on interpretability of the uh, on deep learning techniques. There's work going on. It's not there, and that uh, rightfully people are trying to figure out why it works and why it doesn't work. Right. At the end of the day, if you both, if you simplify this as in math term, you're trying to approximate a nonlinear function, and you don't really know how uh, it works, but you know what relationship it's just trying to find for you. Right. Uh, the way we deal with our customers is we try to use classical techniques and tell them here's the performance and if you have enough data, I can apply a deep neural network technique and try to give you a better performance, but it may not have enough explainability for you to act upon it or take any action if you don't feel comfortable. So that's the conversation. It's not a technical conversation. It's a bit technical conversation and a philosophical conversation that we have with our customers. I hope that answers. Okay. Uh, nice. Uh, so another question, is, um, Igor, uh, what are the common mistakes companies have made while incorporating machine learning and what are the, your recommendations to do things the right way uh, for, for, for this? I definitely, uh, we definitely saw customers stuck in the proof of concept phase for years and never have any path to production, right? So there was never any buy-in to actually use this, right? From the leadership, they, they, yeah, they'll give you, I don't know, a hundred thousand dollars, whatever. They give you, they give you some leeway to go play with math, but there's, there's not enough buy-in. There's not enough understanding. There's not enough. Any of the follow-up just didn't exist. And we actually, in our work, we stopped using proof of concept. Uh, if you want something small, we'll build you a prototype. But that prototype's gonna include some deployment and it's a prototype just because it's a version one and it's probably not gonna be quite as precise as we could have gotten it if we had more time. Uh, so I think that is definitely a key learning that we're trying to impart on to our customers is that just if you're embarking on this, have, you know, do all do a lot of the footwork ahead of time to to, to set some milestones that like, if we can get this, you know, precise enough, it's going to production. This is how it's going to go into production, right? This is what the use cases that we're solving. The other one is of course, addressing use cases with very clear ROI. Um, you know, we, I mentioned this customer who's processing news articles and they've sped up processing news and digesting news about 200 times. And we're presenting this to a CEO and he's just calculating just how much manpower in, in dollars, he's saving, right? And because they need to scale for product sake, but they also, of course, have constraints on staff and all that stuff. So he's just doing the math and like, yeah, yet it's not perfect and we're, it's not a fully automated system. We're basically pre-processing data for the staff to, to finish it. But like, you know, that was a very clear ROI we had going into this project. And so it was very clear 
very easy for the project to win rather than be like, yeah, but it's not always perfect. Well, of course, not always perfect, right? But this was this was like a thirty thousand dollar project, you know. It's a, it's a, didn't it, it was it was a prototype. It was a thing to like, look, this can work. Let's move it forward. And so I think. I think those three are my first, my big two, right? Have a clear path to production. Know what you're looking for and how we, how it can end up being incorporated into your workings, and then really, you know, uh, know what is the definition of success. What are the that we're shooting at, and uh, and be realistic about it, right? Um, obviously, if you need zero errors, machine learning can probably get there, but it's going to be very expensive, right? Um, so if it's business critical that they have zero errors, we, we need to, the budgets need to reflect it and maybe machine learning is not the first thing to look at, right? We should be exploiting uh, RPA or any sort of rule-based uh, decision-making first as much as possible because that has no errors uh, and things like that. So knowing what machine learning can do, I guess, and, and building use cases that are really relevant to that because it's the third one. And I'll stop adding now because. <laughs> uh, great question here. Yes. And also, I can add to this. Uh, I'll answer this question by addressing the two ends of the machine learning uh, pipeline. Uh, I'll start by the data, right? Uh, making sure that companies have uh, the right set of data and the right set of diversified data is really important because your model is as good as the data you train on. So let's take, for example, um, image recognition or facial recognition systems. You have to make sure that you are, um, your, your data set includes people from different races, from different genders, different ethnicity and colors, right? This way you make sure that your, you, you, your, your, your model is representative of the customers who are going to be using it. So that's one thing. This is at the, at the beginning where you're getting the data. And at the end of the pipeline, where you know you have a model and you push it to production, it's really important to know that it's not a one-time thing. You know, uh, Dr. Nikhil mentioned this. It's, you don't just put a model online and it just works forever indefinitely with the right accuracy. You have to be doing incremental training. You have to be taking, you know, feedback from that model, the results, label it, evaluate it, retrain, and then push again to production and then reevaluate. Otherwise, if you don't do this, the quality of the model is gonna be, is gonna deteriorate, you know, with time. And um, the experience that it delivers is not going to be optimal for the users, and then you're going to be losing trust. Okay, great. <laughs> I have a question for you, Dr. Jason. Um, today, one of uh, the most, uh, I think, um, based on my experience, uh, important uh, aspects to to moving to the industrialization part of machine learning is uh, the security okay. part. If we cannot establish a, a, a security strategy to secure our models and our insights valorized by the models, the proof of concept uh, of machine learning will never pass into the, into, the, in, in the, into the industrialization steps. So what do you think about the uh, AI security or machine learning securities and what is the future of, of this uh, issue? Yes, so um, that's a great question. And, um, you know, security and privacy go hand in hand. And these are, um, and, and companies um, are planning or should plan on, on addressing the problem at the infrastructure level, right? From data processing to training to uh, inferencing. So all of these, you have to make sure that you have um, privacy built in and security built in to ensure the integrity of the data and the models as well, right? Uh, so one thing that's important is to have policies. You have to have privacy policies, security policies. You have to have security posture review, right? Understanding where your data is, securing access to the data, making sure that only people who have who are allowed to access the data, you know, from within your company are accessing it, having access around it. When you're copying and training, do you, do you have to have your data encrypted, right? Uh, and then you decrypt while you're training and then you process the content, you generate the model. Is your model um, put in a secure environment where it's also echoed? Where if, if, if someone is trying to maliciously replace the model, you know, do you detect uh, anomalities? So having anomaly detection um, built in your infrasystems are also key to make sure that 
uh, you are guaranteeing the security and integrity of the end-to-end -end machine learning pipeline that you have. Okay, great. <laughs> Dr. Nikhil, I have questions for you. Uh, most of uh, machine learning approaches um, are conceived to detect a pattern in data. And uh, so those algorithms will detect patterns in data which now uh, contains patterns. And it's the problem of to reproduce the results on other topologies of data. What do you think about this uh, limitation of machine learning in, uh, in a business application? Yeah, this, this goes back to my uh, previous comment about where we are in this whole uh, uh, journey of machine learning. I think there is a lot, most of our techniques, 90% is all supervised learning, which is basically meaning that, you know, we have historical data, there are some patterns in it, we have labels for certain things that we want to detect or identify or classify. And uh, that's where most of the machine learning revolves right now. Um, and the impact is actually quite a bit in, in, in the use cases that I see is the customers think they have a lot of data, but they don't have, uh, um, either they don't have labels, uh, good labels to build machine learning models for them and to be able to detect. For example, um, we talk about, uh, predicting failures for machines, uh, or the example about electric grid. But if you don't know uh, in the past we, whether you have right failures and there are right patterns uh, leading up to those failures, it's very difficult to build a good model and use machine learning to predict something in future. Uh, there's actually a whole uh, area of study, we call it known versus unknown. So we know a pattern that has existed in the past and we can figure out how to build a model for it. But then there are certain failures that have no, or certain types of classes that, uh, that don't have any pattern but they are trying to catch them because they, the, the notion for customers is that machine learning can do everything. Uh, it cannot do everything, uh, especially if you have not encountered certain situations in the past, right? Uh, given the fact that we are still relying a lot on supervised learning and the availability of historical data and the patterns within them. So that is a limitation. Uh, again, it's a technological point, but also be able to educate the customers who are still early in their journey in understanding what is possible and what is not, and what are we looking at when we look at their data? Or what kind of patterns can be actually extracted? And if they are not there, what are the ultimates? Okay, so thank you very much for this uh, answer. Um, uh, I have less a question for every speaker. Um, and uh, I will say for you, what will, um, what will be the impact of machine learning in the future, according to your personal opinion? I will begin by Igor. Um, I think on one end, um, we're going to finally see a broader range of organizations take advantage of even just simple tools that are built around some machine learning components, mm -hmm. um, especially in things like making use of data that's currently unstructured, um, that they have been looking at as something that they just cannot automate processing. Um, but I think on sort of in general, what that means is that we're just going to see um, more sort of the boring tasks get automated, um, especially the ones where the data has been the issue um until now so we're going to be able to focus on the stuff that's actually still hard like reasoning around decisions and um other edge cases where that is difficult so it's going to free up the manpower um to to those to do those difficult tasks rather than things like reading a scanned pdf because that's been hard um which is no longer really hard to do properly okay and for you, Jason, uh, what, what will be the impact of machine learning in the future? 
Yeah, uh, building on what Dr. Igor mentioned, I would say now there's a lot of friction in using uh, AI systems. Um, you have to start a specific application. You have to actually initiate it, right? You have to interact, it, uh, interact with it multiple uh, times to get the, the results that you want. I would say as, um, as this becomes more mature and as the devices and the wearables and the internet of things in our houses become more mature, the uh, friction will be reduced and you'll be able to interact with the devices um, in a much seamless way. Uh, <coughs> an example, right? um, with the digital assistance that you have in your house, now you have to prompt it, you have to ask follow-up questions, you have to say the, the wake up keyword multiple times. So all of this will become, um, all that friction will be reduced. Imagine that you, you step into your car and then your car, you have to, now you have to open the app, the navigation app, right? And see the traffic and, and look at your calendar and manage your calls so that you can, you know, have a meeting uh, securely and safely while driving in an uncongested road, right? Uh, this yes. is a lot of friction. Um, but but I, I would say in the future, that friction will be reduced and the interaction with the machine will be much simpler and easier in a way that it complements our life without us having to prompt and, and you know, pull for answers multiple times. Okay. Nice. And for you, Dr. Nahil? Yeah, I think I'll first start by saying that it is very hard to uh, know what the full impact is going to be. <laughs> uh, we are all just uh, you know, scraping the surface. Um, in the short term, I think if I summarize what I've heard is, and I believe that what we are going to do is we're going to fulfill the promise of improved productivity. That's what the first level of impact we are going to get on our own life, improved productivity of ourselves as humans and our machines. Uh, both are going to be possible. Beyond that, it's very hard actually to know what really going to be the impact. Uh, maybe a couple of years down the line, we can have another session and then uh, take another stab at it. Okay, nice. Uh, Igor, I have a last question for you about natural language processing because we talked uh, about machine learning. I know you, you, you know very well this subject and I know that you have um, had the to work on uh, NLP issues. How do you see the future of natural language processing and what are the, the different challenges and the impact of uh, this approach you know, on our future? So I think what what is really exciting about NLP is generating text uh, that actually means things, right? Um, that doesn't just sound good, but actually means things. So helping people write, whether that's actually just generating a summary, but actually, but also just generating novel text. And and I think we are at a place where it sounds good, but it's relatively empty of meaning. Um, um, and so I think that's where we're really going to be powerful. And I think the challenge is going to be governing that um, and dealing with the fallout of having be a, the ability of machine be able to write text. I think until now, humans have assumed that um, it is humans writing text. And once we allow machines to do it, I think it's going to be um, a bit of a challenge in terms of trust and, 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 and yeah. Pri yeah. Um, and the, uh, another... Uh, that I find interesting is finding the right voice, right? So every publication, every organization, they have their own version of the language, right? They speak a certain way. And so having an LP actually generate that matches that. And I think the obvious would be something like tabloid, right? Uh, whatever, New York Post versus New York Times, right? They have different voice. And so to be able to actually generate to match that, I think it's going to be really interesting. And obviously there's some experimental work happening and it's really fun to watch that progress. Okay, nice. So uh, we're up to the finish of our conversation. Uh, I want uh, to, to thank you uh, for your uh, uh, opinions and it was really great uh, conversation discussion and it was a really um, very interesting discussion about the different aspects of machine learning and uh, the impact of machine learning on the futures. Um, th a big thank for the organizers about the this uh, virtual tech talks uh, and uh, see you for another uh, 
exciting uh, subjects uh, like artificial intelligence and machine learning. Thank you so much. That was really great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. Thanks everyone for joining.